So we're talking today about these new guidelines that the Arizona Department of Education is releasing for schools um, to reopen. Um, I, I'm going through the to through the guidelines right now. Um, what are some of the highlights, first of all, that you think are worth noting? Well, first, I want to share that this task force that put together these guidelines was made up of individuals from across the state. It included education leaders, teachers, families, and parents, students. Um, and, and so I think that you know, we had well over 100 people working on this. It's a pretty, pretty comprehensive document, and then there's supporting documents to go with it. So I first just want to express my gratitude for everyone that helped us make sure that this was the best possible roadmap for our schools. Um, then going more into the document, I think it's really important to start off by saying that this is not some sort of state mandate. This is meant to be a very adaptable plan. We know that there's not a one size fits all model for all of our schools across the state. So this is meant to be flexible, adaptable. And we kept talking about that as we put the plan together to make sure that you know we wanted to be as comprehensive as possible, thinking through all the different types of scenarios that schools may encounter. But we we ultimately know that it's our school leaders who are going to be making some of the decisions, a lot of the decisions for their own school communities. Right. So I understand that uh, schools are recommended that to follow um, maybe one of four scenarios. Can you go over that? Uh, what are some of the recommendations for that? Yeah, and again, flexible is the key word here, but so some of the scenarios that we thought were most likely, and of course this could change as, you know, this has been very highly unpredictable going forward, but so some of the, the scenarios that we walked through are, you know, one, are all students back in the building? Are we doing 100% instruction, um, in-person instruction in the classrooms? So that's one direction that schools could be going. Um, there could be expanded online opportunities. There could be 100% online opportunities, which would be, look more like a school closure type of situation. And so we just wanted to be really flexible and thinking through the different types of innovative models that we've been hearing about. Um, you know, some schools are also looking into having different types of scheduling where kids might come in certain days of the week and have a rotating schedule. So again, I think the magic word here is be, being innovative, being flexible, being adaptable, but we wanted to at least provide some recommendations of different things that schools could be thinking about as they move forward. Definitely, and one of the questions I, I keep getting from parents is, are student, students going to be required to pay, wear face masks? Uh, what does the guideline say about that? So again, this is not any kind of state mandate. Uh, we have pointed directly to the CDC guidelines we know that wearing masks can decrease the spread of contagious illnesses like COVID-19. So especially in spaces where physical distancing is not possible, where we do have large classroom sizes or our, some of our high schools have thousands of students that are passing in the halls. So we, we talked through lots of different types of mitigation strategies of different ways that they could be trying to reduce the number of people that are in contact with one another. But there could be cases where one of the best mitigation strategies is wearing masks. And so that's definitely one option for schools to consider. But it's not something that you're requiring, like you mentioned, it's just a recommendation. Okay. We don't, we don't even have, actually have the authority to mandate that. Gotcha. Um, and then when it comes to social distancing, uh, we know that our classroom sizes are among the highest, are among the biggest in the nation. So how is it going to be possible for, for students to practice social distancing in, in classrooms? I think at the rea you're right. The reality is that this is going to be very difficult as we've had um, teacher and staffing shortages historically for the past several years in Arizona, large classroom sizes. So while there are strategies that can be put in place, we, we would also be recommending that teachers are, are teaching their students on the um, best practices around hand washing, making sure that all the desks and everything are sanitized. So there are some other mitigation strategies that can be used to help prevent the spread of illnesses, just like in the flu season or other um, types of, when, you know, when there's other types of illnesses that we're trying to prevent the spread of in our schools. But you're right that um, that's why so, that's why we have so many schools looking at expanding their online options, looking at various types of uh, schedules for their students so that that would also be a way to look at decreasing the number of students or individuals in a given space at a given time. 
So I want to go uh, back to just uh, classrooms for a bit. Um, so our, what's the classroom going to look like? Are desks going to be separated? Um, are they going to be facing the same direction? What are some of the recommendations for how the classroom is going to look? So that's a lot of that's going to be left to the local decision makers, whether that's the, you know, the school board can um, help guide that, the superintendent, the school principals, that um, the recommendations from the CDC do point to having desks more in a row so students are not facing each other. So there, I would say that's a there's a strong possibility that that students will see more of that going forward, which unfortunately has is kind of going backwards from what was previously recommended in terms of having students facing each other to collaborate, do group projects. So they're in some ways, this is kind of sad in that regard that we're going that direction to going back. It's like taking a step backwards to have the traditional desks in rows not facing each other. But that is one of the mitigation strategies that's offered by the CDC. OK, um, and then what about uh, when a student or even a staff, a teacher is high risk for coronavirus? What should schools do? I think that those plans need to be made early. So. I would encourage right now that, um, and I know schools, many of them are, they already have task forces and committees working on this at the local level. And I have talked with superintendents who say they've already been working on plans for their vulnerable staff as well as their vulnerable students. We know, for example, that there are medically fragile students. So I would say when I've been talking with school leaders, we've had conversations around maybe there needs to be more uh, flexibility around those students staying home, especially at the beginning of the school year as we as we're transitioning back into this new academic year for vulnerable um, staff who might be medically fragile or feel compromised in some way. Maybe there's alternative options for them. Um, I think the key word is how can we be as supportive and flexible going forward for for all of the members of our school communities and and thinking of those types of things ahead of time over communicating, making sure that families and teachers and staff are involved in the decision making process. We have a whole se section of that in our roadmap plan of this, these are some strategies for how you can be engaging your community when you're making these decisions because that's going to be so critical going forward to have everyone involved in that decision making process. So, so we could see some schools offer an online learning option specifically or, or especially for those high risk uh, populations. Is, is that kind of what you're uh, what you're saying definitely okay um and then uh, when it comes to uh, uh you know just recess and lunch that's one of the uh the things that kids look forward to when they go to school going to recess interacting with their friends um what recommendations are you making for recess and lunch yeah and again these decisions will be ultimately made by the local leaders but some of the things that we outlined are because uh, one of the recommendations from the CDC is to decrease the the different types of times when there's student passing or different or different groups of students mingling together. So one of the recommendations or suggestions is to think about having lunch in the classroom rather than in the cafeteria. But also thinking about the cafeteria, that's a space where there's the potential to spread students out more, where it's a less confined space. So maybe you're having more instruction in the in the cafeteria or gym types of settings where you can spread students out and really think about being creative about different types of spaces in the schools. Um, then in, in terms of playground, I think those types of decisions will be made more at the local level. I think um, making sure that the equipment is sanitized properly be between use is going to be really important. There could be schools that decide that they just need to close the playground down because there's too much potential for, for sharing terms on playground equipment. Um, but again, back to, it's just going to be left up to the local leaders and there could be communities where there's very low risk of exposure and there could be communities where there's very high risk of exposure and that's going to have a strong impact on the decisions that the schools make. Definitely. Um, and so we could see some schools going back, others uh, you know, deciding to just re, uh, do online learning. But for those schools that do open up, I imagine there's going to be a lot of um, disinfecting, a lot of cleaning, and that costs money. So uh, what is being done or are, are there plans to give, provide them extra funding to cover that? Yeah, there's a couple different ways that schools can get extra funding for, for sanitation types of 
processes and also for purchasing PPE, they can get reimbursed through FEMA and um, DEMA, which is the um, Department of, of Emergency and Military Affairs here in Arizona. So we've been providing them with that information on how they can get reimbursed. Also through the CARES Act funding, which um, is we are still in the process of allocating that, but the but Arizona for our K-12 system will be receiving about $277 million. And schools can also use that money for, for those types of expenditures. Um, they can also use it for things like technology, computers, uh, devices, things like that. So we've been having, um, our, our department has been organizing webinars and different types of recommendations specifically for how to spend the Federal CARES Act funding as well. Okay. And then my, uh, my last question, what is your recommendation for parents? I mean, I, I've spoken to a number of them that some are a little bit nervous about send, sending their kids to school. Others say, you know, I see the emotional toll that it's taking on my child to have them not be able to attend school. So there's mixed emotions there. Uh, what is your recommendation or what, what would you tell parents um, uh, in regards to having their kids go back to school? Um, you know, should they feel safe that their kid is if they do decide to send them back to school, should they feel safe that their uh, child will be protected? Yeah, I think it's really important to acknowledge that there's still so much fear and anxiety and uncertainty going forward. And so I think what we'll see is parents might feel one way one day and then they might feel a completely different way the next day. And I think we all need to be patient with ourselves in making those decisions. So um, my advice straight to parents would be to, to have patience with yourself and you don't have to make that decision today. You can see what this looks like next week or in, a, in the next month. Um, the majority of our schools start in early August. We do have some that start in late July. So it is coming up, but I think I would encourage families to stay in close communication with their schools, with their teachers and principals to be talking about what types of policies and procedures are being put into place to help make sure everyone is feeling safe and comfortable back in the school. But I, I know that our schools are looking to have more types of online learning as well. So I think there's gonna just be a lot of, um, a lot of decisions to be made, but they don't have to be made today. And I, I just would encourage everyone to have, have some patience with ourselves and um, for families to, again, just stay in communication with their schools. And do you, do you see that students will be screened for COVID or maybe temperature checks when they show up to school? Is that something that might happen? It definitely could. So part of our plan that we that's in the roadmap plan is that the screening process starts at home. So right when kids are getting kids or students are getting ready for school, that's the first step of the screening process. We look at it like a continuum and the beginning is seeing how do they feel at home? Do we need to do the parents need to take their temperature then and there? The next um, step could be at the bus stop and thinking about before they get on the school bus, is that, an, is that another opportunity for screening? Then when they get to school, seeing how they feel there. And um, I think some schools could have more screening procedures in place than others. Again, this, this plan is meant to be very adaptable and flexible based on the needs of the school and based on, again, the risk of exposure. So I think that it, it could look different from school to school and there's not gonna be uh, any policing over this, over over how much screening is done, but we, we did provide all these recommendations for our school leaders to be considering to make sure that, and again, they should be talking to their families, to their staff, what, how is everyone gonna feel safe and comfortable coming back to the school community and how, how much, and also working with the county health officials of what do they recommend? How much of that is necessary going into this next academic year? So I think it really should be these should be community decisions that everyone, we should be engaging as many um, types of people as possible in making these decisions so that people feel safe and comfortable going forward. All right, I think that answers all of my questions. Anything else you would like to add? Um, I, think, um, I think another big part of our plan that we that we're recommending is also making sure going into the next academic year that the social emotional needs of our students are met. We know during this time that there could be greater risk for trauma. It could be that there could be a sick family member or even the loss of a family member during this time. There could be job loss or even um, increased homelessness during this time. So we are strongly encouraging our school leaders to be prepared for that, to 
um, to be really thinking through the social emotional needs of their students as they go forward. And then, um, of course, there's a lot of concern about the academic ability levels as students come back from being at home for so long. And so we are also encouraging that there's um, continued differentiation of instruction and figuring out student ability levels as they return for the next academic year to make sure that we have all the interventions in place and whether, the, you know, if there are students that need extra reading time or math to really be aware of, of that as we go into the next school year. I think it's going to look very, this is this beginning of the school year is going to look so different and it's just a, such a unique circumstance that no one is really used to, but we're all working on this together and I hope that our school leaders will continue to um, work with us and we can continue to provide resources and recommendations for having a strong start to the school year. All right. Well, thank you so much, Superintendent Hoffman. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you, too.